Okay, so hi, my name is Maxina Ventura, and um, I'm from East Bay Pesticide Alert, also known as Don't Spray California, when we're focusing more on statewide issues. And we do a lot locally um, here. And we called together this info meeting. We were getting a lot of uh, inquiries about the Light Brown Apple Moth Pesticides Program, and um, a lot of people from San, San Leandro Community Action Network were very concerned, so we're sort of co-sponsoring this event. And um, you have the chance to hear from people who, you know, are sort of at the heart of the, the beginnings of the storm, but we're all in it now. So I want to introduce uh, who will be speaking on the panel. Um, this is John Russo and, um, and Isabel, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, Yarnishis. Uh, <laughs> um, and this is Rami Nagel. Nagel, sorry, I'm so sorry. We've been, gosh, emails back and forth. And Stephen Mano. Um, so I will, with no further ado, Hi everyone. Can, now, do I need the microphone or can you turn it down? Yes. All right. I'll use the microphone then. <laughs> First off, um, thank you for having me here today, and um, thank you for being patient uh, with us. Uh, being that we're about 30 minutes late, we had to come over the hill, and with the weather and everything else, it just took us a little longer today to make it. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm John Russo, and um, this is Isabel Genichis, and uh, we're uh, StopTheSpray.org. <laughs> um, let's see, we got involved. Um, first off, uh, how did most of you folks hear about the light brown apple moth spraying? I'm just curious to get a show, to get a feel for how you guys are getting informed. Picked up a flyer here. Newspapers, anyone? Newspapers, friends? E emails, anything from the government? Anyone get informed <laughs> from them? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, just to kind of give you a history of how, you know, I was informed. Um, I was at uh, my grandmother's uh, house having dinner one day, and uh, she had a card from the government that was announcing they were going to begin spraying operations within a week or two. So that's about how much notice that uh, we got down there. And, you know, the card kind of said, hey, we're going to, there's this problem with this moth. We're going to be flying planes over your house and spraying with this pesticide. But don't worry, it's totally safe. There's no need to be worried about it. Um, it's a pheromone. It's not going to harm you. But if you are worried about it, maybe you ought to bring your pets inside and, like, wash off the picnic tables outside before you eat on them and bring your laundry in that day and, you know, a few other things. But that's not necessary because it's all safe. So she was asking me, what is this? You know, it's like, is it safe or is it not? Why are they telling me it's safe but to bring in my laundry? You know, what's going on? And I said, well, you know what? I... I don't know, i never heard of this thing before. Let me go check into it. And then that sort of just led me on this path of the last six months to um, kind of being here where I am today. Um, you know, the, you're gonna hear some things about the spray and I just kind of wanna, wanna tell you what you're gonna hear and just tell you what we know and um, give you some information to be armed with just for your own self and you know if you do wind up going to some of these public meetings and you do see some of this information you'll be able to ask the right questions and maybe help inform others out there about what the truth actually is it's it's um, frightening the the misinformation that's going around first big thing that we heard and unfortunately you continue to hear when you go out is this is just a pheromone they keep saying that over and over again. In fact, I was at an environmental impact report meeting in Monterey on Wednesday of last week, and um, the, the head of the uh, environmental impact report project, uh, Jim Raines from the CDFA, was there, and he started off his presentation talking about it just being a pheromone. <laughs> in fact, we pleaded with him in that meeting to please stop saying that, you know, because it's not just a pheromone. I put this uh, chart together because it's important to see it in black and white so this isn't just hearsay going back and forth. Um, what they're, they sprayed, well, they sprayed us with a couple of things in Monterey. They started off with something called Checkmate OLRF. 
Um, they sprayed that two times in Monterey, and one of those times, an 11-month-old uh, child actually went into respiratory arrest and had to be rushed to the hospital, and that family has since uh, moved out. Um, but if you go to the petition on the Stop the Spray website, you can look up comment number 212 from Tim Wilcox. That's the father of the child, and you can see how he felt about the whole thing. Um, Checkmate OLRF, we never found out what was inside that chemical because they told us it was trade secret, which was shocking to me to think that the government felt they could spray the people of California with something, but that we didn't have a right to know what was in it. And that it seemed to me that trade secrets should end the moment the product is taken off the shelf and loaded into a plane to go over like an urban area. There was a lot of concern about this, a lot of pressure. In the end, they never did release the contents of that. The governor did issue a request, not an order, but a request for the company to release the contents. What the company said they would do is not release the contents, but they would change the ingredient to something else and release those contents. So they changed it to LBAMF and released the contents of LBAMF and proceeded with the remainder of the aerial spraying in Monterey and Santa Cruz with that. Okay. Um, so we know about a little bit about what's in LBAMF, and um, you'll still hear them say it's a pheromone, but there's 11 ingredients in LBAMF, right? And if you talk to the pesticide people, which I am not, they'll start talking to you about actives versus inerts and whatnot. Well, there's 11 ingredients in there. Um, you know, some, one of it's water. You'll also hear about the inerts being this urea, which is, they say, is a totally natural product that you shouldn't worry about. <laughs> I, I know what I used to think urea was, and I certainly didn't want people dumping it on me. <laughs> but um, you'll notice urea is like number four on the list. There's water. There's one, two, three, four. So they talk to you about the pheromone. They talk to you about urea, but urea is number four. If you look at number five, which I can't even uh, pronounce, this um, butylated hydroxylene, something like that. Okay, so you guys are better than me at this. Um, that's number five, and if you look up the spec sheet on number five, it says may affect genetic material. That doesn't sound very good, mutagenic, meaning it causes cancer, and in fact it says it's been shown to cause cancer on laboratory animal tests. And you go down to this, this other stuff, this tricapryl methyl ammonium chloride, and it's toxic to aquatic organisms, right? And when you look at it, what's really more, this is actually a picture of what these little capsules are, because these are little plastic time-release capsules. Because the pheromone, if they just sprayed it as is, it would just dissipate within a day, and they'd have to spray every single day at, I guess, expense and annoyance to everybody on the ground. So they, what they're doing with these other materials is they're putting this pheromone in this plastic capsule that sort of degrades over time, and then that releases the pheromone into the environment. And if you can see these little plastic capsules, they're like little BBs, you know, somewhere between the order of 10 microns up to 300 microns, which is right now a big source of debate. And the reason why this is so important is because down at 10 microns, they stick in your lungs and they don't leave. Your body can't get rid of them. Um, so, I mean, what we're really breathing is, is a plastic soup. It's not very good. We've, we've heard of all kinds of things that plastic is doing, and um, I have a slide on that. Okay, you had a question? Well, that's a good question. Right now, most of the information that I'm talking about is coming from the Department of Food, the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Um, they are acting under intense pressure and certainly with significant funding from the USDA. So the USDA is certainly, the fed, which is the federal government, is certainly in there somewhere creating conditions that are causing people to react um, with this, I'm not even going to call it a state of emergency, with this act of emergency, because um, 
one of the things we'll find is there is no actual emergency declared by the governor. So the, there is the USDA that is, is involved imposing some, cons, um, some pressure, but most of the information like you and I will get will come from the state, from the Department of Food and Agriculture. Uh, the, the Department of Food and Agriculture? Well, the Department of Food and Agriculture is, is I mean, that's in the executive branch, so the secretary... State California Department of Food and Agriculture. Are they accountable to the governor? Yeah, they work for the... So, Kawamura, the secretary of that department, works for the governor, so he's an employee. Yeah. News report yesterday pointed out that the uh, U.S. Yeah, I'm not aware of that. They have sanctioned it in certain respects with regards to, like, this, this pesticide isn't approved for this type of use. The EPA, in an emergency kind of process, approved it to let them do what they're doing with it. So in that way, they did sanction it. I didn't see the news article, so I don't know exactly what they're referring to. I, I have heard rumors of federal people saying that they have the power to spray us if California refuses to spray us. I have not seen any concrete documentation with that, but I have heard those rumors that that has been said. Right now it's the state, though, executing the program, and that's where most of our focus has been, is on the state. Okay. So, you're breathing this toxic soup. What is that like? Well, we've got uh, my uh, partner here, uh, Isabel, who's, who actually lives in the spray zone and was in her home um, when the spraying operations uh, were occurring in SoCal and can give you sort of a first-hand account of what it was like for her um, when they were spraying um, over her home. Okay, I, um, in fact, I live in SoCal, which is in, uh, it's just on the border of the spray zone from Santa Cruz, in Santa Cruz County, and so I'm, I'm in fact in the drift zone, so not uh, makes a little bit of, of a difference because the the airplanes are not flying right over you but yeah but they just uh, um, so it, it's just the drift that comes to you and you you hear the planes going in and out but they at least they don't make passes right over your house which must be extremely frightening um, so uh, the spray gets applied by airplane. They fly at about 500 feet above uh, the houses, which is very dangerous. It doesn't happen very often, but uh, we know of one occurrence, uh, I believe it was in Florida or in LA, where an airplane actually crashed into a house. I mean, that is uh, a very, uh, Mm, it's not, not happening often, but it is a possibility. And it's uh, the usual height over heavily populated areas that you can safely fly as a pilot um, is, is usually a thousand feet. So this is uh, quite extraordinary. Um, I mean, I'm not going to go into too much detail. It was uh, in the run-up to the actual spraying in Santa Cruz, and I know also in Monterey, there was a lot of misinformation about when uh, the spraying would occur. There was announcement made uh, that it would happen in the evening when it didn't because of fog and weather. We had lots of delays. So there was a lot of... Um, confusion as to when it would actually happen and then when uh, the spray was uh, given the go-ahead there was n not many people were aware, aware of it actually happening at that specific evening and lots of people were caught outside in the spray directly which is not good and you could also imagine that even if you do send an email to everybody on a certain email list, which CDF Day, you could sign up for an email alert, uh, which I did. Um, so I did get that, but not everybody has email. Um, it was not on TV. Um, in fact, the, the local TV was still running that it was delayed. Um, so, I mean, there was no siren uh, call, no radio alarm or whatever. Tourists don't know about this. And so we had people who were just out and about uh, going shopping or coming from work, 
who got caught in it and you have people who simply don't have a house like the homeless who have not been uh, there was talk about homeless emergency shelters well that has not happened and so um, actually I see in the back John Tilken who has put up petition together where he uh, was asking specifically amongst the homeless in Santa Cruz and he found that there was uh, a higher percentage of homeless people who had severe or adverse reactions to the spray which is very worrisome just one aspect of environmental justice that immediately comes up with this whole issue because of course the more impact you have on elderly children uh, people with chemical sensitivities, which um, is actually a, a disability that's recognized. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, unborn, unborn children, you know, I mean, it's, it's really troublesome. And um, where I come in <laughs> is not in that specific group. I'm luckily a very healthy person, and I was not too worried about myself in the run-up to this. I was... Um, I was not for the spray. I thought it was a ludicrous idea for many reasons, but I did not expect to get sick from it. I thought, well, it's after all um, a little better than a conventional insecticide, and so I thought, well, it's probably going to be fine for me. I'm not. I don't have a history with asthma or any like that, and I don't live in the spray zone. And I was very surprised to feel. The, the immediate reaction to the spraying, like a, a burning in the eyes, a dry mouth, and um, uh, actually a, an elevated heart rate, which is really weird, like you drink tons of coffee, and, and it lasted for about two weeks, and that was also very frightening. And uh, especially worrisome for the women, is like it, I had about PMS for two weeks too, you know, so it's really not pleasant. And lots of women have reported that, and that's, that's, very, that's very frightening. We had a scoping session in Santa Cruz on Thursday, and there was a, a doctor there that um, said that endocrine disruptors, which is you know what what this does, you know, it affects your um, endocrine system. They are known to be a key to breast cancer, and so that's um, very worrisome. Um, now, at first, I I was dismissing these symptoms. Um, because I'm not familiar with pesticide exposure, I'm, I've been lucky not to have been in contact with anything like that, and I didn't know that a pesticide can actually do this to you, and that in fact that these are common effects um, of these inert ingredients that John mentioned. Not necessarily the pheromone, we really don't know much about that, it has not been studied very much, but we actually can look up, and I did that, I googled all of that, you know, uh, like you can look up the other ingredients in the in the in, in the pesticide, which it is classified as a pesticide by EPA. So if somebody says, yeah, but it's not a pesticide, you can say it is a pesticide, <laughs> definitely. And there has been a little bit better coverage in the San Francisco newspapers about that, so we were kind of happy to see that. But so I googled all these ingredients and I, I find out to my horror that it's, um, it's very well known that, uh, that these kinds of symptoms can occur. And then what I have in front of me as two publications, not really publications, it's just uh, two papers that were put together by two uh, groups that have um, extensively worked on the issue. One is in Monterey, it's HOPE, Help Our Pen Peninsula Environment. And the other one is in, in Santa Cruz, the California Alliance to Stop the Spray. And they both put out um, uh, documents to, uh, to alert uh, the agencies to the to the health effects. Um, uh, while while uh, the, um, the document from CAS from the California Alliance to Spray was sent to the public health agency, the county public health agency, and it was asking them to, um, to look into it and to establish a monitoring program for, for these health effects because uh, there was no uh, way to report these other than going to your doctor and filling out a form. Um, now, I, would, I did not do that. I did, my health effects were not uh, bad enough, and you know, I, I don't have good health insurance, so I can't afford that anyway. So, um, in the end, I believe there was something like 65 official 
doctor reports that came in from those fall sprays. And also there was 330 reports of adverse reactions that were um, called in at the CDFA's own hotline, a telephone line. Um, that was also not published, though, that you could leave a uh, complaint there. I mean, it was not a, a, a good situation. You know, you're, you're basically telling the people who are spraying you that you're sick. You know, that's kind of not so good. Um, and then the, the third uh, um, way to report your health uh, complaints was um, to a private... Um, to a P.O. box or an email that was set up by this, by HOPE, by uh, Helping Our Peninsula Environment. There was not much circulated at all. It was just, if you knew about this program, if you were somehow involved in the anti-spray movement maybe, then you would probably know about that. But other than that, but they managed to get uh, another 300 um, uh, reports of illnesses that way. And they put it all together in this in this report, and it was sent to a lot of people. I mean, the governor has had it, Maria Shriver has had it, and you know, all the legislators have had it, the, the health agencies, so they all know, they all know. And you can just look through it. I mean, the, just a few things that I've experienced, you see those mirrored in, in many other reports. They're sometimes handwritten, um, which is very touching to just see how people describe what happened to them. Um, there's, there's other um, effects that was much severe than what I had had and um, John mentioned the, the little boy that almost died and I've heard of two other instances from children having first time asthma attacks which is very worrisome indeed. Um, to headaches, I've heard a lot, muscle aches, body tremors, um, sore throat, sinus bleeding, vomiting, I mean it's really not pleasant. Um, so you can download these reports on online on stopthespray.org. You just go under resources and documents. And that's where you can find them. I believe there's even a link on the on the front page. Um, and that's what I what I do want to say is that um, it's really great that this work has been done. And I think it has helped us a lot in making our argument that this is not good and that this is a dangerous product. Uh, the problem will be that they will use a different product next time. So it's good to get our facts straight and to know what has happened uh, and that we not necessarily can just trust uh, something to be safe that CDF says, uh, CDFA says is safe. But to me, that really it, that doesn't work anymore. Um, we have to get together as we do today and, and all do our part, make our voices heard, write letters, write emails, organize and stop this. And I, we have come very far, but it will need each and every one of you to make that difference. It's been encouraging so far. Um, we just heard on Friday that some bills have been introduced into the assembly that, that will help us along much further and that will prevent something like this happening in the future. And those bills only have been passed because people have, have called the legislators, have written letters, you know, have, have stood up, have visited with them, and we have to keep doing that. We have been heard, we will be heard, but it's, it's going to be a lot of work from each and every one of us. So that's what I need to say. Thanks, Isabel. So you've heard about sort of the impact on, on people and, and Isabel's experience, um, but there's also other things you're gonna hear. Uh, one is, will it have an effect on the environment? Well, what you'll hear with regards to this, because obviously if you look, read the, the, um, the uh, even the product label, it says you can have inhalation problems and um, skin irritation and things like that. The other thing you're gonna hear is, yeah, but don't worry about that, because the concentration is gonna be so low that it's not gonna affect you like that, right? That's gonna be another thing you're gonna hear. 
Well, first off, I showed you the ingredients before. They never gave us the concentrations of how much water versus how much of those other chemicals are in. All we have is a list of ingredients, kind of like on the back of your loaf of bread. I mean, we don't know how much of that stuff went into this chemical. These are also the ingredients that go in at the start. It's not what, because they react, they're active. So we don't know what they actually do and what is actually in the spray that sort of gets sprayed down upon us. And the other thing I think it's important to realize is that data is coming out all the time about, you know, low dose toxicity of chemicals that have in the past been thought to be safe at certain levels. And, you know, it's just kind of a, a litany of, of, of history where we've gone, oh, this is safe at this level as long as it's not above this. And then, you know, 10 years later, somebody does actual research and then we go, oops, you know, it's a <laughs> guess what? It was a lot lower than what we thought. And these are just, these chemicals aren't, aren't in the spray that we know of, but these are just historical examples where the government has said, like with bisphenol A, you know, that, you know, they assumed no cause to be harmful at this level. And recent studies show dramatic effects to reproductive systems of animals at the red level. The same with atrazine, which is in fertilizers, and this meth, meth uh, oxochlor. I mean, this just goes back time and time in history. So them telling us that the concentrations are so low doesn't comfort us, as well as there's been human errors where they've dumped much higher toxicity. The other thing that doesn't get taken to effect, thanks Isabel, you'll read, if you go through the archive, in fact, this was on the CDFA website, this article up until recently, I don't know if it's still there, but you know, after the spray, hundreds of seabirds were washing up on the shores of, uh, the beaches in Santa Cruz. And, you know, there was a question, it's like, does this have anything to do with the spray? And the answer was, no, of course not, because we stayed 100 feet back. Well, you know, they even had the fish and game go in and they did some tests and they said, ah, oh, it was the result of a red tide. Well, this red tide was something that had never been seen out there before. It's a red tide this large. And, you know, in talking with some, some chemists and some other folks, you know, there's contents of the spray, these surfactants, that they believe would actually feed a red tide if it were to get out to sea. So now the question is, well, could the spray have gotten out to sea, taken a red tide that does occur naturally, and turn it into a monster red tide that started causing these hundreds of birds? I mean, the, the news report says over 500 dead birds were found, and you know, we've heard anecdotal reports much higher than that. Well, if you go back to the history of the spray, and this isn't what, in Santa Cruz, and you won't hear this, I mean, in the meeting on Wednesday, they were debunking this again without this data. Well, they sprayed Santa Cruz on November 8th. It was scheduled on November 4th. This is what Isabel was talking about, everyone getting surprised. But there's fog. I mean, the weather doesn't always cooperate with the CDFA. We're supposed to, but, you know, Mother Nature has her own mind, right? So it was foggy the 4th, the 5th, the 6th, the 7th, right? And it was foggy kind of on the 8th, too. But it broke, and then there was a rainstorm moving in right behind the fog. So it broke a little on the 8th, and they said, ah, and they rushed the planes in and sprayed all over Santa Cruz, and then it rained a few days later, right? So what happened? Well, I don't know, but I bet all of that spray just ran right into the rivers. In fact, they had lots of people taking samples and looking at it under a microscope. And you see all these little beads like you saw in that picture on the last one. All this ran into the river. And the council members of Santa Cruz were telling us that the municipal guys were pumping this foam out from under the boardwalk that they had never seen before, you know, in the, in the days after. So all that, it rains a few days later you have some of the largest red tide formations that anyone has ever seen. I mean, surfers were marveling at, at what this was. And on November 28th, this is exactly 20 days in this sequence, hundreds of dead birds are washing up on the shores. And the official report is it has nothing to do with the spray. It's, it's just this weird freak red tide that happened. Well, you know, this is not definitive proof, but it's far too much of a coincidence for me to say that we should be continuing this without at least having scientists looking into this and trying to understand if there's any plausi you know, plausibility behind you know, what's going on. Um, 
And then there are safer methods. Um, this, this chart shows um, one that's, pretty, that's often advocated by David Dilworth, who's the executive director of the Helping Our Peninsula's Environment. Um, you know, the only thing that's ever catches and kills moths, this pheromone doesn't kill anything. It just causes, causes them not to be able to find girlfriends and stuff. And so they fly around lost, I guess. And then supposedly they don't have babies and then, you know, the, it sort of dwindles. Well, these sticky traps are how they find these things. These are how these maps um, actually get generated. And that's the, the only thing. They have pheromone in them, so it kind of attracts the moth into the traps and then they get stuck there. That's the only thing that really kills them in anything that they're doing. Well, these moths don't actually fly all that far. They, they fly maybe about 100 yards, you know, which you can throw a stone. So David's come up with this proposal about just, hey, you don't blanket the state of California with sticky traps. These moths are in certain places. If we put the sticky traps in those places, and then as we find them in other places, you expand the radius of the sticky traps, you not only get the infestation, but you also get evidence of the migration of these things, and you would be able to actually follow them and, and have a much more effective deployment of things like sticky traps, which would totally avoid the whole exposure of the environment in humans to, um, to pesticides. Now, there could very well be additional things that need to be worked out. This is just something that him and his, staff, his team have come up with. But, you know, as recently as Thursday, he had tried to even talk about this with the government at their, in their um, community task force meeting and, you know, hasn't been able to even get on their agenda. So, you know, it's just a little frustrating. So, you know, kind of what can we do at this point forward? Well, you know, I just wanted to, to tell you like the gentleman said, well, the, perhaps the federal government is involved and they're going to claim they have the right to spray us. Well, the state certainly did. I mean, Steve Lyle's famous quote that we used to run on our website until recently was, you know, the authority rests with the state. You have no vote. That's what he told us. I mean, direct. He was quoted in the Santa Cruz Sentinel that, well, you know what? I say we do have a say. And I say that we have a say over whatever gets sprayed over our head. You can't spray me in the face with anything and say you have a right to do that. If it's going into my lungs, I mean, if we can't even control that, what control do we have over our bodies at all if we can't control what we breathe? It's ridiculous. And you know what? I'm not alone in feeling that way. This here, this document, I brought it along so you guys can see the magnitude of this. These are 8,000 people that think that way. I don't know if you've signed the petition on Stop the Spray Dots on. If you did, you're in the stack. But these are 8,000 people and their comments telling the government, no, I have a right to say whether or not I'm going to breathe this spray or not. And you can see the thickness. This is having an impact on our government regardless of whatever they keep telling us these laws say. And we need to keep drilling on them because we're standing on very solid ground here. I want to read something out of the California Constitution. Okay. This is Article 1. This isn't the Bill of Rights tacked on to the end, kind of like the federal constitution. This is Article 1 right in the main body of the California Constitution. Section 1. All people are by nature free and independent and have inalienable rights. Among these are enjoying and defending life and liberty, acquiring and possessing and protecting property, and pursuing, not just pursuing, but obtaining safety and happiness and privacy. So the California con Constitution tells us that we have the right not just to even pursue, so not just to go around saying, hey, I'd like to have some safety, right? But actually to obtain it. I'd also like to read a little bit out of the California Environmental Quality Act, because this too provides a basis for our assertion here in this document that we have a right to this say. Um, California Environmental Quality Act, Division 13, the environment. 
This section states that it is necessary to provide a high quality environment that at all times is healthful and pleasing to the senses and the intellect of man. At all times. It doesn't say unless there's like a big agricultural business interest. Then, it's, then, you know, you don't have to be helpful. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say special interests trump this. It says at all times, right? It further states that government agencies at all levels are required to consider qualitative factors as well as economic and technical factors and long-term benefits and costs in addition to short-term benefits and costs and to consider alternatives to proposed actions affecting the environment. That means we don't have to just sit there and listen about how much money will be lost by certain individuals or the fact that we haven't proven well enough this, you know, with 600 claims and, and, and everything else that this has a harmful impact. No, that's not what the, the environmental law says. Right? Further, California Public Resources Code, that's what I'm talking about, states that it is necessary to ensure that the long-term protection of the environment consistent with the provision of a decent home and a suitable living environment for every Californian, not just for a small elite minority that profit from this particular action. It says every Californian. That means that it has to, you can't do things that drive people out of their homes, even if it's only 600 people out of their home. That's not every Californian. I think they're walking on very shaky ground. I don't care how they try to justify it. And we're not alone with that. I, you know, just to tell you some of the comments in this, you know, here's one from Judy Gibson from down my way. I moved my family to Monterey for a cleaner environment. Please keep this a healthy place to raise children. You know, this is Christy uh, Seabach. I have the right to fresh air. I have the right to raise my children in a safe environment. I have rights you cannot take away. This is what we need to say over and over and over again. Okay. Yeah, okay. So we'll segue over. I just want to wrap up that um, we have the petition on StopTheSpray.com. If you haven't signed that, please do. I'm sorry, .org. Yes, not .com. .com is a... A different, uh, those are some, some people fighting a similar fight in New York. Also, um, you know, there's some council meetings coming up I want to t tell you about. There's, um, they're both on Tuesday. One is in Oakland and one is in Berkeley. They're at uh, 6.30, I believe. Seven? One. The state is coming to Berkeley, yes. It's a safety meeting. It's their safety committee. Yeah. I'm sorry if I had the specifics wrong with the politics, but the reason why I'm bringing it up is because they're considering resolutions much like Albany and Monterey and Santa Cruz to, to say, no, you can't do this in our town. And we need, like in Berkeley, I'm, I've been told the CDFA is showing up. The public needs to be there to show them that, you know, they're, these 8,000 people are real. Yeah, and I can tell you more about my experiences in both of those meetings. But, you know, the council meetings are very important because even though the state is doing it, they can't ignore 
thousands and thousands of people and local governments banding together saying, you won't do this in my neighborhood. The environmental impact report meetings I have been to, but you know, it's a little bit of you do what you do, you say what you say, you try to get these things considered in the process, but in the end you have really little control over, over what they do. So um, anyways, I'll turn the microphone. Over to Rami Nagel. Hello. Um, so I'm a father and I learned about the spray at the farmer's market from the woman who runs the albamspray.com site, which is a good website. Um, so I just started investigating. I'm a health researcher. And of course, it's hard to know where to start. Um, I, I, at some point, I had this vision, and I, I kind of ignored it for a while. And as these planes coming over Santa Cruz, I used to live in Santa Cruz, and I did move out on November 4th, about half an hour before they were supposed to spray, but they didn't spray that day. And I had this vision of this plane coming, and it wasn't a harmless something. I really felt like it was attacking the root of my being here. And I didn't understand or acknowledge that vision until I did more research. And after I did more research, then I got scared. And I, and I just took my family out. We went to San Jose to my parents' house and have not lived in Santa Cruz since. Um, unfortunately, we got sick when they sprayed in Monterey. So we lived on the coast in Santa Cruz by the boardwalk, 40 miles from the spray zone. And on the last day or the day before the, Mo the Monterey spray um, in uh, October sometime, I think October 10th, I don't remember exactly when it was, my whole family got sick. Um, uh, both my partner and my daughter had uh, vaginal discharge which they've never had in their whole life. And I got uh, poisoned. I couldn't eat for five days. I've never been, I haven't been sick in a long time. I do lots of health things, health oriented things. Um, my urine got almost a red color, which again has never happened to me before. And I felt like I was poisoned. Uh, there's another strange thing that uh, Isabel mentioned just being in Santa Cruz, I started feeling jittery after this um, October spray, which was in Monterey. And there's this kind of high euphoric feeling. I, I can't quite describe it. Very strange, unusual feeling. I found, I felt like people had problems communicating with each other. Now this is before they actually sprayed. So I, um, I was trying to get some samples analyzed and I called this guy, random guy at the microscope, microscope store and he said, oh yeah, I got sick too. I had red urine and I was vomiting. I haven't had food poisoning. And I said, oh, maybe that wasn't food poisoning. He said, well, you know what? All these people came into my store and I've heard of all these people who got sick in Santa Cruz. Now this is before they sprayed. And I talked to some other friends and they also had this food poisoning where they had this severe vomiting on the same day. And there's even an article published in the Santa Cruz Sentinel of this woman who lives somewhere in SoCal, same day, that Saturday when they sprayed in Monterey, who got sick. So originally I thought that was spray drift, although it's hard to imagine how a spray can drift 40 miles. Later, this <laughs> very sensitive, nice woman said, I thought I saw this plane spraying chemicals one night and there was a green trail coming out of it. And, and to me that made sense of what happened. And I, I really believe that we got sprayed before we were supposed to be sprayed. Now there's no way to document this in any way. Maybe the government has it on their satellite. Um, so it kind of makes I really started listening when people started making jokes about the spray. Oh yeah, they're coming to get us. Oh, we're all going to get cancer. They're trying to make us infertile. 
I ignored all those things, but then I started listening because it's like, how did I get sick from that? It, it doesn't make any sense. So um, it is important that I just want to comment on some things that they said. Each person who hears about this needs to do something about it because the the monster that this is is huge. Uh, when I learned about this prayer was going to happen, I felt completely shocked. I mean, this is. Uh, um, there's something really shocking about, there's lots of bad things in the world, but there's something shocking about what's going on here that's extraordinary versus what actually is happening. Oh, they're just spraying some chemicals? Uh, they're just spraying this amount of stuff. You know, they spray things all the time. It doesn't bother me. But there's something about this that bothered me. And what, what is particular concern that I found when I was doing some research is that um, when they, one of the truthful things they say, although there's many things about this, they basically are lying to the public, is they're not using a lot of chemicals. So when they spray, I don't know what the exact amount is, it's a very minute amount of chemical. And so their argument is, because it's a minute amount, nobody gets sick. But, the, but, that isn't, but what actually is happening is people are still getting sick, even though it's such a small dose of chemicals. How does a small dose of chemicals designed for a moth make people sick? It doesn't make sense. Um, if you've ever, you know, think of something toxic like paint fumes. Have you ever inhaled paint fumes or anything like that? It makes you a little bit sick. But reproductive health problems, vomiting from a very, very minute dose of chemical, how does that happen? So, um, my opinion is that that's, that can't be accidental. It, you know, you don't design a car without a brake. You don't design a, a chemical to stop them. This is supposed to be harmless to even a moth. How do you design a chemical that's harmless to moths that makes people so sick? And, and the number of people who got sick is huge because I got sick, my family got sick, Isabel got sick, lots of people got sick and did not report it. So with 643 reports and, and documentation, the real number is many times higher. Mo many people got sick and say, oh, I had the flu. They don't know what it is. When uh, someone gets poisoned, let's say they eat their bad spinach or their bad beef, you go to the doctor, and then the doctor, if they suspect it's poisoning from something, they fill out a form. And then the state investigates it. And what does the state do if they have a potential even that people got sick from food poisoning. They recall it. 643 complaints, nothing. Hmm. They, they've recalled uh, raw milk from one or two complaints with no evidence. Now the published ingredients, that's what they tell us. We actually don't know what's in there. As, as far as I know, no one's done any laboratory analysis. Are they going to tell us the bad ingredients? Or are they going to tell us the ones that aren't going to be a problem? So whatever they have reported is in there, it's not necessarily what's in there. The fact that they, what they reported is bad means that what's really in there is probably far worse. Um, I'd call, I talked to the person at the Fish and Game in response to the birds getting sick, and they said, we have this chemical lab. Our chemical lab is so good we can tell you who manufactured each ingredient that we find in our chemical tests. Guaranteed. Never had a problem. Somehow they don't know what this strange cer surficant is that they found. They don't know what it is or where it came from. Hmm. Um, another thing in terms of talking about what's what's a reasonable way to approach this pro problem. The sticky traps are a good solution. Um, in the first spray, spray zone maps, they didn't even encompass all the places they found the moths with the aerial spray. They just were spraying mostly residential areas. So they didn't even pretend like they were trying to eliminate the moths in the original spray zone. They only got smarter later. In this new map, they included all the moths. But before that, the, the original eradication plan only uh, was targeting the cities and not all the places where they had found the moths. 
Um, and just to give you an idea, how many moths had they found in Alameda County? Huh? Anyone? 481 moths in 130 square miles. It was the 13th of February when I went into the office and I asked a number of pointed questions. The answer of, you know, to which was generally, I don't know. Well, when I asked um, about the number of um, moths found in the county to this point, she said, well, don't quote me on the numbers. I'm not sure. I think about 200. One would think that, you know, with spray plans and pesticide use plans right around the corner throughout this county, the Agricultural Commissioner's Office would have a pretty good idea of the most recent numbers. So uh, obviously 480 moths is not going to do anything. That's, of course, that's how many they found. We don't know how many there are, but there's probably not more than, not too many. That's uh, not going to do anything to all the apple orchards in Oakland, right? And there's, there's probably pretty much zero, I don't know if anyone has studied, how much crops are actually in the zones where they're planning on spraying, but it's probably close to zero. So again, why are they doing that? Hmm. Um, now, if you want to talk about, uh, one thing they say is, oh, we have to protect against the embargoes, blah, blah, blah. They don't tell you, they forget to mention that the, the moth has been in Hawaii for 100 years. There's no embargoes on Hawaii, their agricultural community is fine. So even the money argument, also um, the estimated damages, all that stuff, that's totally made up. They just pull that out of the air pretty much. But the argument when people say, oh, it's financially motivated, uh, at least from the government's perspective, doesn't make any sense. Because if Hawaii doesn't have embargo, why would there be embargo here? The USDA, Spain, uh, giving 75 million this year, and they estimate this is for the crop damage estimated to be at 160 to 640 million by the government. By the time the program is done, they might spend several hundred million dollars, which could even exceed their estimated crop damage. Of course, there's not been any crop damage. Um, now, here's a, here's a little tricky problem. If you say no, they still spray. If you vote no, they still spray. Even if the state of California votes no, they're still going to spray. And uh, it's important to, for people to understand, if you don't want to be sprayed, just saying no is not going to do it, and just the county is saying no is not going to do it. You have to use force to stop them. It's going to require police officers or guards or whatever to prevent the planes from taking off or a legal injunction. There's probably nothing else that's going to stop this um, government attack. So it, it really boggles the mind, uh, I'm finishing up, why they would be doing this. There's lots of other things to spend money on. Schools, prison overcrowding. Yeah. Well, they might be able to stop them next year. That's what they're saying. They're, you know, they're going to vote no. It's just like the San county of Santa Cruz and the city of Santa Cruz said no. I oppose the spray. And as many signatures as there are, a majority, almost everyone, I think a majority of people is a, are opposed to being sprayed. But their opposition doesn't stop it. That's an important thing to look at. Well, it also does, uh, I mean, just to address the legislation, most legislation, if it goes into the current calendar year, would be take effect in the right. subsequent calendar year. I understand, but when you said that, I was just wondering. Well, you said that there was no way to stop it. <laughs> is, is this just <laughs> But as we've learned, like with the LMAM Act, as Isabel so astutely pointed out in our meeting with John Laird's office when they were telling us, well, you realize this can't take effect until next year, she said, well, the LBAM Act was introduced in 2007 and it passed in two months. 
same year. And then they were like, oh, well, you know, we needed a bank account to deposit all of our money that we we're getting from the federal government. It's like, ah, so if you need something really bad, like a bank account for money, you can get, you know, something done in two months. If it's something like people are being poisoned and, and getting sick, it takes a year. And she said, well, it's just a matter of we need to put in an urgency clause. And it's like, yeah, one of them. Well, we'll take one of those urgency clauses. <laughs> Now the deal is, though, with the urgency clauses, you've got to get two-thirds majority vote in the houses, which means that the amount of public support needs to wash them over like you've never seen before. Money seems to wash everybody over up there, but, you know, sickness doesn't. But um, I think we need to do that. Another thing that we have just uh, seen was there's an USDA handbook about emergency uh, regulations and at the, pretty much at the end of it is a section on what ends an emergency uh, program and there's six points uh, and one of them is, uh, was it socio-political opposition to the program? There you have it. You can stop this, absolutely. I think uh, the petition and the city councils and everything are really good things. Um, it's just important to not place your faith that that's going to stop it right now. And that more, if you want it to be stopped right now, you have to do even more than, I mean, let, the 20 laws opposing this in the state or however many there are on all the various levels up to international level should have been enough for this not to happen. Um, it, this is really a wake-up call for everyone to look at how bad the government has gotten. So let me give you some stuff to work with here on the idea of pressure. So uh, East Bay Pesticide Alert, um, sort of followed on the heels of Sonoma Pesticide Alert. Um, we've sort of been working since the mid-90s. Um, and the um, Glassy Wing Sharpshooter Program, I've been trying to help people understand, this is an eerily similar program. The Glassy Wing Sharpshooter, we had it all over the news, Alameda County, Sonoma County, and around, all around the state um, in 2000 and 2001. Um, and that program, statewide spray program, it was very interesting to watch the, this program developing too and go, you know, going, wow, <laughs> very similar. So there, uh, you know, of course, as a big PR firm, paid a lot of money to be, um, you know, making people feel like it's all okay. Their CDFA has Peter Novelli, a big firm, in place here. They've gotten five hundred thousand dollars here. Wow, we had seven hundred fifty thousand taxpayer dollars being spent on the glass wing sharpshooter project to try to convince people it was okay. So, as activists, we came out and looked at the program and said, "Wait a minute, this is another bailout program for conventional agriculture. They've wrecked their soil. They have unhealthy plants. Therefore." they are more liable if anybody's going to have a so-called pest problem to have pest problems. But the reality was, just as with the light brown apple moth, while we were hearing in the news, devastation, we're you know, devastation, oh my God, the, the $12 billion California wine industry is going to go to pot. You know, all these, everything is withering down in Temecula in Riverside County. Well, a couple activists from our bunch went down to Temecula and said, there is no more devastation than the typical devastation of conventional agriculture. A few withered vines, but it's another bailout thing. And, um, and so, you know, the, the emergencies were declared and so on. The money machine was fed and uh, spraying did begin. We had two days notice in mid-March of 2000, two days notice before aerial spraying was beginning down in, um, in Southern California. The first place in, 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 uh, in Northern California, Brentwood, nearby Brentwood, was being targeted around the Glasswing Sharpshooter. Now the interesting thing was, there was an interesting new subdivision. That was the area that was going to be sprayed. Not the vineyard across Balfour Road, no, not the vineyard, but the area across from the vineyard. Not a drop of spray other than drift was gonna go into the vineyard. So, um, <clears throat> So that was set up as a five-year program, and from the onset, it was set up with, with the sort of wording. Well, it's a five-year program which can be renewed, and when you hear that wording, you know that the, the renewal is basically automatic. In other words, there's not going to be um, 
you know, there's not going to be a hard time getting a renewal through the state. So I, wanted, I want people to keep this in mind that, yes, this is a horrifying program before us right now. And to keep in mind that, in fact, it's, it's one in a number. So with the glass wing sharpshooter, as soon as this hit, of course, the first thing we did is go to the organic farmers around going, well, what do you guys think? And they're going, it's no big deal. It's just another insect. And we're going, huh, okay, this is what we thought. And, um, and we're going, well, come on out and say it. And they're going, but it's, it's just no big deal. It's just another insect. Why should we take our time to come out and speak? And we're saying, because people need to hear it from the farmers. And to hear it from the organic farmers, they're saying, we've got healthy soil. Our plants are healthy. They can withstand some challenge. It's just not going to be a big deal. So we got them out there immediately, you know, to be talking publicly about that. And that made a difference. In Sonoma County, people um, really rallied around organic farmers. And I would say that um, people were getting most riled up about the private property issue. And we had an organic farmer out there who made quite a statement. <laughs> the, uh, I think it was in the Press Democrat up there, um, Topolos, who said, you send anybody onto my organic farm and I'm going to shoot. And it's not that I advocate that kind of you know, mentality, but that, you know, <laughs> That woke people up. He said, you know, I've been working years. You know, I've got healthy soil. You're not going to come here and ruin my farm. And so there was a lot of that, that feeling, and that extended to people's... People were pissed off. You know, all these, all these growers had come up and planted conventional wine. A lot of people's wells were drying up because of this wild use of water. So, that, you know, we had, we had a lot before us to, um, to help people understand, you know, this is just another bailout for people who are already causing you to have to pay $40,000 for your new wells, you know. So we did have more behind us there. Now here we have all this health information um, of what's gone on already, but people are already stricken by it. And so we need to then, of course, j jump off of that. Um, these programs, they come one after another. There's the glass wing sharpshooter program. There's this program. I've been saying, we're going to hear soon about the gypsy moths. And certainly, you know, right now, just in the last couple of weeks, I, the Secretary of Agriculture on Michael Krasny's uh, show just last week, the forum, sure enough, he started talking about the gypsy moth. So that's the next one they have in line to create a whole new uh, emergency program. Now, why would they do this? This was very interesting to track in 2000 and 2001. I was calling agricultural commissioners across the state, up and down the state. Um, I was finding out, for one thing, s uh, county by county, they often, they did not have correct information. I had more information than them in many cases. Even in counties abutting, they did not know what the plans were in the next county. Um, but they were all very happy to say, oh yeah, we're getting new trucks, we have staff guaranteed for the next few months. It was interesting how open, openly, happily, they were talking about this. Um, so this helped me to understand this as a necessary funding mechanism, mechanism for these agricultural departments around the state. If they don't have another pest of the month, around which to create a manufactured crisis, they are not going to have as much funding. And you also need to know that the way the funding comes through, it comes through for pesticide use programs. I mean, there's different, there are different avenues for funding. But a lot of the funding is specifically for pesticide use. We have that here with mosquito abatement, too, here on West Nile virus in the county here. We did a big presentation in 2005 to mosquito abatement. And it, we, it was acknowledged by our local mosquito abatement um, that the funding that they have around West Nile virus, they have a lot of funding that is pesticide use specific. They can't take that funding to do what you might think would be going on. They can't take that funding to go like door to door and say, hey, can we help you, you know, look around your yard and see things that you might change to, you know, be less mosquito friendly. It's not for that. It's mosquito. It's, uh, it's pesticide-specific funding. So that's one of the things that we also need to keep in the backgrounds you know, of our minds uh, as we look at these programs, because this will not be the last program of this sort. So now, you know, there has been this focus on aerial spraying, which is horrifying. I've lived through it. These photos are photos I took when we lived in Sonoma with my family, certainly. That, that right there, that, that crop dusting happening right there, See that little road? It's a two-lane highway. You know what's across the road from this two-lane highway? You see that? that uh, and he's heading right toward this two-lane road. Right across is Fish and Game, right by the sloughs leading into the San Pablo Bay. 
Now, do you think Fish and Game was out there worried or talking? I was photographing for five months, and I spent three and a half months air monitoring for a pesticide drift study. You can find those on our website. Uh, you, you can find photographs. You can find, um, you can find the pesticide drift study. Um, the, out of uh, 84,000 applications um, up to that point, pesticide applications in Sonoma, the Air Resources Board had never done any, any, any air test in Sonoma or in Napa counties. And the staff scientist for DPR, Department of Pesticide Regulation, which people think is there to protect us, said, when I said, well, why not? Well, you know, was her response, we don't, we don't think there's a problem. <laughs> we don't see a need for it. And then she said, we've, you know, we, we, we're not aware of anybody having health problems. And I said, well, in fact, you know, we've been doing health surveying, Sonoma Pesticide Alert, and other groups, West County, uh, California's for Alternatives to Toxics, we've been doing health surveying around. We have identified three cancer clusters in Sonoma Valley and Lou, Lou Gehrig's and, and Parkinson's clusters. We, wanna, you know, we want you to know that and we've been trying to get public health agencies and others involved. You know, no, everybody's turning us away and nobody will do an epidemiological study. And she was going, well, we're just not aware of these health problems. I said, oh, let, let, me, let me find out then, where, where is the Department of Pesticide Regulation getting your information about health problems? Her response, oh, well, OSHA complaints. And I said, oh, well, that, isn't that interesting? So I'm surrounded by vineyards where we've got a lot of undocumented workers. Some of the most innocent of people, you know, in, getting, <laughs> you know, getting um, hit by pesticides every day without a lot of choices in their lives. They don't really have the chance to go into medical facilities and, you know, have OCHA claims being made on their behalf. She said, well, I guess you're right. <laughs> so my experience in years and years, this is, this is my daughter in early April, in early April, <clears throat> early April of 1998. This horrifying s situation is what we lived with. This is how we lived and how other children and other people live. When you're in spray zones, this is, this is the reality of daily life, and this is what people in Santa Cruz and Monterey counties have been living with. Bloodshot eyes, stuff coming out of every orifice. When you're being, dealing with insecticides, you're dealing with the body trying to detox through any orifice, through the pores on your head, through your ears, your eyes, all parts of your body, um, genital areas. You just have everything, you know, your body just trying to get out of anything it can. This is not an extraordinary photo from Sonoma. This is daily life for many people. Yet, doctors, you know, in the midst of Sonoma and Napa, nobody would ever acknowledge pesticides. I did have a dermatologist say repeatedly, um, when I, I was just trying to get stuff there on record, oh, it couldn't be pesticides. I'd say, so well, what do you think it could be? You know, and he said, well, I have a neighbor, I have a friend who's, who would be a neighbor of yours right in your little, your little area. Gosh, she constantly has stuff like this going on. And I said, well, there you are. And I was walking in with pesticide use reports and stacks of toxicological profiles to go with those. And, you know, between one appointment and the next, you know, he said, oh, this is very interesting stuff you brought me. And yeah, this neighbor has a similar stuff going on. I said, there you are. You've got the information. He said, no, but it couldn't be pesticides. And I said, well, what do you think it is? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> End of subject. And this is what people have been dealing with in Santa Cruz and Monterey, with doctors and with public health. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit, just a little bit more about synergism. You were getting to it, John, a little bit. You talked, you didn't use the word. When you have a chemical mix, you're when you have a pesticide product, you have what are called active ingredients and you have what are called inert ingredients. But, but we need people to come to understand what's called inert is not the inert that we think of, not that dictionary meaning that people tend to think of, you know, benign, uh, non-reactive. It, it simply is that uh, a, an inert ingredient is something that's not the, the ingredient that's specifically stated on the label to be doing the, the, um, the particular action, the scrambling of the nervous system or whatever. They're support. They're the ones, they're the chemicals that are the support players. And so you can have, you often can have in a pesticide product 99% uh, or 99.9% .9 inert ingredients. 
but don't be fooled. Um, Will Sumner, who's a toxicologist uh, to whom I was delivering uh, the air monitoring samples um, for the pesticide drift study I did, made very clear that, in fact, it's low doses that often cause more troubles um, over time. He said it's not one-time exposures for otherwise healthy people that are the biggest concern. It's repeat exposures. This light brown apple moth program is a repeat exposure program so that it's set up for several years, um, probably to be renewed very easily, um, and you would be dosed again and again and again and again. And so you're not being dosed with one chemical that's been studied for its effects, no matter how faulty the studies. What you're being dosed with is a group of chemicals. And the interaction between the chemicals has not been studied. But what is has not been studied and put out there publicly. But what is known is that when you mix chemicals, you have synergism occur, which means that the, the, the overall effects can be much, they can be compounded and be much, much stronger than the, the sum of the indi individual effects added. It can create a whole lot of chain reactions and, and, um, and that is something that you're not getting when you're, um, you know, when you're talking to Sutera or you're talking to any of these chemical companies, they'll talk about their active ingredients. So here's an example from Monsanto, Monsanto, ubiquitous, ubiquitous Roundup. The old line Monsanto used to feed, I heard their Martin Lemon say it, you know, right in front of me um, at one of his informational meetings for farmers in Santa Rosa um, and for growers. And he, he said, um, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, because we'd been doing so much around Roundup, trying to get people to understand how toxic it is. And we were talking about a surfactant, which is associated with cancer. And so he came out there saying, Hey, you know, the glyphosate, the activate or glyphosate, uh, is the active ingredient. It doesn't cause cancer. So at that point, we didn't have the information in hand that it, you know, that there are direct connections with the active ingredient. So that was their little way. That is what you, you hear by these pesticide companies, and you'll hear from CDA, you'll hear these snaky statements. Oh, the active ingredient doesn't. So we need to keep in mind, it's not always the active ingredient. Often it's the supportive supporting ingredients that can be as toxic or more toxic or can create a more toxic situation. Um, I just wanted to point out that while we're focusing on the light brown apple moth, obviously here, um, when you go to our website, uh, which you can get to either as eastbaypesticidealert.org or don'tsprayCalifornia.org, the name we use when we're working on more statewide projects, you can learn about um, a lot of those basics around Roundup dangers and all. It's kind of like a great site for being like a pesticide primer site. But um, you can also uh, you can also get to photos that you can and let people know about this of, of drift. I want people to understand aerial spraying is horrifying. And this is typical tractor broadcast spraying. This is you know right across the street from me. This is the same as the kind of effect you'd have from a truck broadcast sprayer, like what would be used with West Nile virus spraying, what's being used in Brentwood for the glass sewing sharpshooter program, and what could be used here, too. So we need to stay aware that, well, of course, we have to shut down this aerial spraying. We also, at the same time, need to be saying no toxics you know, must be used. So one of the pretreatment plans for Santa Rosa, Monterey, and all around the county um, of Alameda in different places, and, uh, and Marin is a pretreatment with permethrins. They're saying, oh, permethrins, it's just permethrins, um, no big deal. Well, so the, the plan is to be painting permethrins on utility poles. We've heard up to like 3,000 per square mile. These are neurotoxins. They are acknowledged as probable carcinogens by the EPA. They scramble the chromosomal, you know, the chromosome, the chromosomal, uh, work in the body. Um, basically, you don't want that stuff in you. Again, you can get to that, that toxicology from our website. We've got stuff right here, too. Um, and I want to read something that was submitted by the, the county of Santa Cruz in their lawsuit. There are four lawsuits going around this right now. They are all focused on the aerial spraying, for starters. This was by a professor of pharmacology and toxicology with the University of Western Ontario in London and uh, Canada. Um, so, 
blah, 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 he's talking about it. In none of the documents I reviewed, including the USDA environmental assessment, is there any mention of previous experience with aerial spraying of populated urban areas. Previous efforts to control the light brown apple moth in the proposed treatment area employed ground application techniques. Pheromone braided traps were placed throughout the state of California to monitor the moth population and distribution, so on and so forth. There's, uh, there's ample evidence that many pheromones and, uh, and semi, uh, semiochemicals, the synthetic counterparts of pheromones, possess significant toxicity for aquatic species, and on and on and on. Um, anyhow, he, he makes, it's, it's very useful to look through this. Um, he, he's saying they're in, inappropriate extrapolations from irrelevant, irrelevant toxicology, uh, toxicity studies, and are suggestive of a poor understanding of basic pharmacological and toxicological principles. He's an expert, but the CDFA says it's all fine. It's all fine. Um, this I want to point out uh, right here. This is right by the Oakland Zoo. So every time you drive by on 580, this is what we call the Great Wall of Poison. Half the year, uh, they, they, they've changed chemicals. Now they're using simazine, one of the horrors from my old neighborhood, which explains why I keep being sickened. Um, it, uh, you can read up on that on our website. If you click on Caltrans, you can find the toxicology about simazine, Roundup, the rest of the year. But I mean, you know, all these different agencies, they change products regularly because when you use pesticides, which comprises herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, rodenticides, bactericides, you create, um, you create uh, resistance. So you have to keep changing products, and that's what happens. You know, when you, when you get farther down the line, you end up in situations where you, you end up with chemical sensitivity. I know I look really healthy, and in some ways I am. I spend um, often three days at a time homebound. Isis can talk about being homebound for days at a time. You'll see me in town sometimes having to wear my mask. And my doctor suggested that maybe I need to be getting an industrial mask. You know, kids run away from me, even with this little lacy thing. They think I'm a monster. You know, I can smile at them or whatever, you know, layers of carbon filtration here. And my doctor is suggesting I might need to get an industrial mask, like that. So... So I want to pass this on now to talk uh, to, to um, Stephen Munno to talk about um, the organics world, um, you can introduce your, your actual, um, yourself with your actual sort of title um, from UC Santa Cruz, uh, because this is an issue larger than, you know, it's not just about our human health, it's about environmental health, and it's, it, it gets into looking at, you know, labeling laws and our right to clean food and, um, and such. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stephen Munno. I'm a, an assistant garden manager at the Farm and Garden at UC Santa Cruz, part of the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems. Um, what I want to talk about is the idea of, of crop damage with the, with the light brown apple moth, the organic certification, time spent with inspectors, uh, extra and excess handling of crops as a result of all this, and quarantines, and just the spraying in general. So uh, I was, I, I do work on the farm, and we were sprayed um, in Santa Cruz, and it has not affected our certification. So if you're wondering if people are going to lose their certifications, that's not the case. Um, I was involved in a discussion with uh, somebody from the CCOF, and basically what they've told us is they've not, they've not approved the spray for organics, but what they've said is they're, they're not going to remove certifications from farmers who've been sprayed, which I think is a very sensible approach as being as we're not requesting it, we're not applying it ourselves, so they're not removing it. But then uh, you, there might be a, a misconception in the public as to organic not having these chemicals on them and when in fact they do. So, so we continue to sell our produce in our, in our community supported agriculture at our farm stand um, under, the, uh, under the idea that it's organic. Um, but if you go into the world of organic certification you know that there's all sorts of things that are permitted that you might not otherwise think. So just as far as you as a consumer out there wondering about your food, I just I would suggest always to know your farmer as best you can and know it, know it, know your farmer intimately because the label doesn't always say everything. Um, 
So that's just a little bit about that. As far as my experience with the light brown apple moth, we do, they do exist on our farm and in our gardens uh, at the university. We had inspectors from the CDFA and the USDA on our farm setting traps looking for, for these moths and they are in fact there. Um, we haven't, however, seen any kind of damage as a result from these moths. Uh, and I will say what Max was looking for is, this is just another insect. It lives on our farm and it's not doing any harm for us. Uh, might we take measures ourselves if this weren't going on? Perhaps if we found it eventually to be a problem, we'd probably take some, some measures maybe in, in the realm of a trap like as, is being used to find them. We do that for the coddling moth, which does some damage to our apple trees, so we've got traps in place for them. Um, so that's something that I would think that we would do for the light brown apple moth, but at this stage we've seen no damage uh, on our farm. And I can say as a, as a friend of other farmers in the area in, in Santa Cruz County and in Monterey County and, and coming further up north, I have not heard a report of any damage from these moths on anybody's crops anywhere. So as an idea of an emergency, I, I don't see it, but um, you know, I guess they are working on the assumption that there could, there could be damage at some point, but again, I've witnessed none. Um, there is, however, damage going on economically to farmers, gardeners, landscapers, nurseries from having to spend a lot of time dealing with this issue. It, it, becomes, it becomes quite a large issue as a farmer when you have to do so much. There's so many aspects of being a farmer that you have to spend your time doing marketing, farming, growing things, working on your soil. Um, accounting, just th there's a tremendous amount of work that a farmer or a gardener or anyone in this business has to do and then to now be spending time with inspectors and going over your your plan for dealing with it and for spending extra time looking at your crops, extra time handling your crops uh, is a tremendous drain and, and it makes some things you know, no longer profitable. You know, one example would be strawberries which you know in our county is a, is a tremendous crop uh, for for economic and, and it's you know so much enjoyed you don't really want to handle a strawberry you know you want to pick it put it in its basket and that's it and if you need to be looking through every one you now are selling these damaged kind of manipulated strawberries so that that's a big issue I think is just the time that people are that farmers are spending to make sure that they don't have any larva from the light brown apple moth on them so that, that's a tremendous issue so we've gotten into quarantines as well. So, so farmers that have had large numbers of light brown apple moth, and I can't tell you what the threshold for a large number is, but I know that there have been farms and farmers who've, been, who've had their products quarantined so that they couldn't be shipped out of the county. Now, lots of people, uh, lots of those farmers who've been quarantined don't necessarily have their stuff shipped out of the county, but they're told not to sell them anyway on the chance that they might leave the, cow leave the county. Um, so that's, that's basically making things, you know, if, if, if life as a farmer weren't economically challenging enough, having this addition I, I, is quite challenging. So, and of course, there's, there's not any compensation. You're just expected, you, you sort of, ha you have to comply with this at, at this stage. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what, what we all will do on the farm in this upcoming season you know, to, to, to try to put stuff out there. Max showed me something earlier about buckwheat and th there's all sorts of integrated pest management ways to do that. I, I'd say, for the most part, we are already employing these things. We are already, we already have many systems in place to deal with this kind of, of issue by promoting a healthy life cycle, health, a healthy uh, sort of food chain in the insect world. When we, have, when we have one kind of pest, we try to establish habitat for something that might want to eat it. And that's how, that's how we kind of get rid of things. So we have a nice uh, system of perennials where there's always habitat for uh, beneficial insects. And, and that already exists for you know, something that might want to eat the, the light brown apple moth. So I, th I, think we've, I think farmers who are in, you know, solidly in the organic world and beyond that are already well in position to deal with this pest. Um, and like I said, it is just to, uh, to me, and to the people I work with, although I, I want to say I, I don't represent the University of Santa Cruz and their views. Um, <laughs> so, there's, there's not, I don't believe there's going to be an official line coming out of the university, but I, I'll say, you know, 
to us, it, it's just another, it's just another pest. Um, but I, I believe it was November 8th, the, ninth, the first night that they did the spraying. They made at least 20 direct passes right over our farm, right over the university. Just back and forth and back and forth. And yeah, it was definitely, it was definitely frightening um, seeing it up there and, and having them go by. And I, I wondered, you know, how much is enough? I mean, I, I think I, I lost count around 20. And then I know they came out the next night and did at least three or four passes. So I, I don't know what is enough uh, to get it done, but it's definitely there. And, you know, I'm out in, and my coworkers are out on the farm and in the garden you know, all day, every day. So we're out there the next day regardless. And, you know, we know those chemicals are out there working the field now. I can't report any symptoms from being out there in it myself. You know, and I'd say people that I worked with may have gotten sick during that time, but d there was no way for any of us to say it was because of this or that. So um, I, I, I can't myself report symptoms, but I know it was out there, you know, and I eat all the food that I grow. So I still feel well. I'm a generally very healthy person, and I'm not susceptible to too much for illness. So, you know, I, I don't know, but I, uh, obviously we've heard reports of people being ill, and uh, I think that speaks for itself. Um, that's that's generally what what I have to say about it. I don't I don't think it's a worry. I think the the program is is misguided and uh, you know, will ultimately prove to be ineffective, that there's really no way they're gonna eliminate or er eradicate. It's just, that's not an option. We, we see it, and I can say this, this, is, this is sort of agreed upon amongst us working at the farm, is that it's here to stay, and we're gonna be dealing with it, so why not learn how to, how to live with it and, and incorporate that into our system of management rather than trying to you know, falsely believe that we might eradicate this thing and, and risk all other sorts of our systems. That's what I have to say. Could, was hoping that we could now um, uh, just take a few minutes for people to get together and uh, and talk about sort of areas in which uh, people might want to get involved. There are so many avenues. Obviously, there's work going on on the legislative end. Uh, there is uh, work going on in terms of gathering people up to to create more informational meetings. Um, there, we need to get people to come to these meetings in, on Tuesday evening uh, about the Berkeley and Oakland resolutions and then about the environmental impact report scoping meeting where CDFA will be there and some of us will be there. And um, see you later. So, <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much. And uh, there are many other avenues. You know, in Sonoma, one of the things that was very effective and, you know, around the glass wing sharpshooter, we really kept the state out of Sonoma. Partly, I believe, because we took such an aggressive stance. That included people getting ready to do civil disobedience. So we had nonviolence preps happening and, um, and were well attended. So people got ready for that concept of defending their homes and families. So, um, you know, have that in the back of your minds um, and think about, you know, over time. If they're ready to come and, you know, paint permethrin on our poles here all around San Leandro or aerial spray or uh, deliver in whatever manner toxic chemicals, you know, how are we each going to individually respond and then how together as a larger community? First step off, uh, you know, being getting people to actually get to the websites and get to the various grassroots groups' websites um, to look at the toxicology the actual toxicology, because you need to know that you're hearing, unfortunately, lies from CDFA. And, you know, the best way for you to do it is look at the toxicological profiles and look at the references. And the funny thing is that often the most damning e uh, evidence ends up coming from governmental studies that are not well publicized, but we try to publicize them. It's like there's the left right arm and the right arm, and they often are not talking, but actually there are some really, you know, useful government studies that show up often, you know, decades after we've known things are, are toxic, but the, the government studies eventually then are done, they finally become public, and then, you know, we can work with those. So, um, put down the microphone and then just uh, get people into little grouping, see, you know, what interests you, and we should be exchanging, we've got so emails and phone numbers, if you haven't signed, please do, because we also want to help keep people up to date about, 
you know, what's going on as soon as we hear new developments having to do with San Leandro. For instance, as of the 15th, San Leandro was on the list to have permethrin painted all over utility poles. By a couple days later, we found out that that wasn't the case, but that could change in a day's notice. But why isn't it the case? Is it that they're on the way to um, actually delivering things aerially here where they weren't before saying that they would be? So it's, it's kind of a shell game. The other thing I want to mention about the shell game thing is that when they're talking economic damage, we have to be retorting that, you know, you can't ever talk about, you know, those economics side by side with health. But if you want to, take me as the token, I have so many pre-existing health conditions related to chemical injury that no, no insurance company will take me. doesn't matter what money I want to throw at them, they won't take me. So I've now ended up on county rolls. So now county taxpayers are having to pay my way. So, you know, it is just a shell game. And the more people end up at this level, the more people are going to end up on county health rolls. That's the reality. <laughs>